We are teaching a message today entitled, The Gateway to Divine Favor and Miracles. Wouldn't you like to know where that gate is? <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, we're going to find out today. It's not a mystery. Turn with me to Mark chapter 6. We'll read verses 1 through 6. And when you're there, say, I'm there. If you're heading in the right direction, say, I'll be there. <laughs> All right. Mark chapter 6, verse 1. And it reads, When he went out from there, he came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. Verse 2, And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter? The son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. This is an astounding passage of Scripture because we are so used to reading the many, many Scriptures that detail and testify to the healing power of Jesus Christ. We're so often re used to reading, and he healed them all. For instance, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, it says that he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. He cast out the devils with a word, and he healed all. Everybody say, all. all. Say it again, all. All. All who are sick. That's what we're used to reading. But here in this passage, it says in verse 5 that he could do no mighty work there. Well, there is a tremendous difference between the two passages. Here he's healing all. Here he is doing no mighty work. Here is nothing but mighty works. Here it is no mighty works. If we can figure out the difference between the two. We can understand how to stay on this side of the blessing. In Nazareth, his hometown, he could do no mighty work. That's what I want to avoid. If I can figure why that is the case then I can flow in the blessings of the Lord. I can find the gateway of divine favor and blessings and miracles and signs and wonders. How many of y'all want to find that gateway? Well, it's not a mystery because Jesus tells us in verse 4, He said, A prophet is not without honor except. In other words, a prophet has honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. The problem was they were not honoring him. They were not honoring his person. They were not honoring his words. They were not honoring his presence. Turn with me to the parallel passage. Same historical event, but the parallel passage in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 they did not honor his person. Jesus, when he entered into his hometown of Nazareth, Bible says in this passage that he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom. And when he went in, they handed him the scrolls, scriptures, so that he might teach. And he found the passage in Isaiah, a messianic passage that was referring to to him, the Messiah. And so he stood up and he read this passage. We have it recorded in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And the Amplified Version says, when the free favors of God profusely abound. Jesus stood up. He said, I'm here, the Messiah is talking about me. I'm here to preach about the favors of God, the free favors of God, in other words, grace, for grace to abound in your life. And the Bible says in verse 20, when he had read these things, all the eyes of everybody in the synagogue were fixed on him. Can you imagine the atmosphere of that place because it would be palpable with the anointing Jesus said the Spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me and can you imagine when the Messiah spoke the prophecy that everybody else had been reading for 700 years but they read it as a historical account, looking forward to the day. He read it as fulfillment. Amen. For he said in verse 21, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Come on, say amen. In other words, he said, Where it says the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he said, that's the me they're talking about. For he has anointed me. That's the me that we're talking about. For he has called me to preach the gospel to the poor and has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Me. He was saying, I'm the me. I'm the me. And they said... Prophet? Messiah? No. Carpenter. We know you. You grew up down the road. Three doors down on the left. We know you. Prophet? Messiah? No. Carpenter. And the Bible says in verse 3 of Mark 6, they were offended. They were offended by his person, by his declarations of being prophet Messiah, king of the Jews. It offended them. They could not receive his person. What they saw was carpenter. They did not honor his person. Nor did they honor his words. Because in Luke 4 and 22, it says, All bore witness to him and marveled at his gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. But then they said, Is this not Joseph's son? Were they the words of the Messiah? Or were they the words of Joseph's boy? They did not honor his words. And ultimately, they did not honor his presence. Because at the close of the passage in Mark 4 and 28, I mean Luke 4 and 28, it says, So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. And rose up to thrust him out of the city. They did not want his presence. And they led him to the brow of the hill on, on which their city was built. That they might throw him down off the cliff. They did not want his presence. In fact, they did not want him to be alive. How do we get him out? No. How do we kill him? They did not honor his person. They did not honor his words they did not honor his presence honor is the key 
honor of the person of Jesus Christ. Honor of his word. Honor of his presence is what swings wide the gates of divine favor and blessings in your life. Honor is a powerful thing. Honor means that you prize, that you value, that you assign worth. You say something is worth, worthy in your life. That's why we worship him. He's worthy. He has worth to us. We, we honor when we, when we value something. Uh, we honor when we declare that something is not common. It's not common. It, it's set aside. It's consecrated. It, it's not common. Did anybody grow up like I did where, where you had the, the everyday China and you had the good China? Me and my brothers ate on the everyday and then maybe on Thanksgiving, we were allowed to eat on the good china with the guests that came over. Yeah, the everyday china was actually chinette. It was a paper plate, actually, what, what it was. But the everyday china, because there, there's a difference between common and consecrated. You know, when you value something, you set it aside. You, you treat it differently. Uh, a baseball is just a baseball until Babe Ruth signs it. And then it becomes something completely different. Yeah, that goes into the savings deposit box. That's, that's, that's a keeper. You know, uh, th things have different, different values. You treat it, you treat it differently. It, it's not common anymore. You know, a, a, a painting by the masters is different than a painting by numbers. Is it not? Yeah. Though I like painting by numbers. I don't understand all the paintings by masters. I, I saw a show. I like, I like art a lot. My brother's an artist. I like art, art a lot. And, and uh, I saw a documentary. And you know what the most expensive painting ever sold at auction? You know how much it, it went for? $250 million dollars. In 2011, 250 million, I said million, 250 million dollars. And, and if one of y'all bought that, I need to talk to you after service. Because huh? it's time to sell that thing. But um, I got some plans. Um, 250 million dollars. You say, that, that must have been some painting. Not really. It, it was a painting by uh, Paul Cezanne. It was a painting of two guys sitting at a table playing cards. $250 million. There was another one. It was only $80 million. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a large painting, $80 million. And at the top of the painting was a big yellow block. And at the bottom of the painting was a big red block. And in the middle was a blue stripe. $80 million. And, and the, the fellow that was doing the documentary asked the, asked the guy who bought it for $80 million. He, said, he says, why is this worth $80 million? Yellow block, red block, blue stripe. Why is this $80 million? He says, oh, the artist. This artist did something that no one else has done before. And, and I'm thinking, <laughs> yellow block, red block, blue stripe. I have vivid memories of kindergarten. <laughs> opening my Crayola box. And asking the kid across the table, can I borrow that yellow Crayola? I've got an $80 million idea coming up here. $80 million. $80 million. I, saw, I saw a car auction where a car, a muscle car, you know what those are? Those are early American cars and they have a lot of horsepower and whatnot. A muscle car sold for $300,000 the other day. $300,000. And uh, 
And I thought, i got to see this car. It's going to be an amazing car. And so the, the camera was panning around. I literally stopped in my TV room so I could see this thing. Show me the $300,000 car. And the camera is pan, panning around. And here is a chassis up on blocks. And the engine is sitting over here. And the drive shaft is sitting over there. And there's some tires scattered around and parts of this and that. And I thought, he spent $300,000 for parts. Parts. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what the reporter said. You spent $300,000 for parts. And um, I mean, he said, you can't even drive this thing home. And he says, it'll never be driven. He says, but once I put it together, it is such a rare car. Once I put it together, it'll be worth $800,000. You know, honor is when you assign value to something. What makes it valuable? Well, it's rare or, or it's unique or the, the quality of, of the construction is, is so superb. Or maybe it's a, a gift from a loved one and has sentimental value to you. Or, or maybe it's some, from uh, some distinguished person, a VIP has given you something and it has great value. It commemorates a moment in, in your life. We, we uh, assign value to something. What, what the people in Nazareth could not do was assign value to the person of Jesus Christ. They could not assign value to his words. They could not assign value to his presence. And therefore, Jesus did nothing in Nazareth. But this is what he told them. He said, God is going to bless somewhere. He said, there were many widows in Israel during the famine, but... Elijah went to the widow of Zarephath, a Gentile. There were many lepers during the time of Elisha, but Elisha went to Naaman, the Syrian, a Gentile, to receive his healing. All God is looking for is someone that will honor his word. Dip seven times in the river if that's what it'll take. Honor his presence. Honor his person. God is looking for somebody to bless. And I say, Lord, we're swinging wide the gates. We honor you, Lord. Bless us. Bless us now, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. The gateway to favor, divine favor and blessings, is honor. Could it be any more simple than that? Specifically, honoring the person of Jesus Christ, honoring the word of Jesus Christ, honoring the presence by the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. Jesus, interestingly enough, said in John chapter 5, verse 22, he said, the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I say that we, the body of Christ in the world today, we must, we should honor the person of Jesus Christ. He has been so good to us. I remember hearing a, uh, a sermon preached, 70s, 80s, can't remember exactly when, but the um, pastor was preaching under great anointing, and he, he cried out, my God, my God, what have they done to my Jesus? And I thought, what have they done to our Jesus? He said, they call him Jesus Christ Superstar, and they dress him up like a clown. He's the Son of God. He's God the Son. He's King of Kings. He's Lord of Lords. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He's the door. He's the good shepherd. He's the Alpha to the Omega. He's the author and the finisher of my faith. 
He is the Lord God Almighty. He is the Word of God incarnate. He is the Lamb slain before the foundations of the earth. He's my elder brother. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Oh, he is my Lord. Hallelujah. 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 We honor his person when we give him thanks, when we bless his holy name when we testify of His goodness, when we give Him credit for all that He has done in our life. I love to bless the Lord. I, I love it when we come together as a church. You, you folks know how to get your praise on. I love it when we praise Him. I love it when we thank Him. I love it when we, when we bless Him. My, my favorite songs, you know what it is. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. You know, Psalms 103. And all that is within me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Gives all my iniquities, heal all my diseases, delivers my life from destruction, and so forth. It's, we sing it almost every service. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is our... Y'all getting tired of that yet? No, don't get tired of it. It's good. Yeah, it's the only song I know, but it's a good one. It's a really good one. It's word. It's scripture. It, it's a really good one. When we... When we, when we bless Him, we, we honor His person when we give Him credit for what He has done in our life. We, we have given uh, newspaper um, interviews of uh, when we paid this building off, when we paid the, the next generation off, did it for cash. And uh, uh, the, the reporter asked each time, how did you do this? And I, was, I, I said, same thing both times. I said, this is exactly how we did this. God sent a man of God with the word of God to tell us that we, if we would believe him, could pay this building off in 40 days and this church believed the man of God was speaking the word of God therefore the windows of God were opened up and the blessing of God was poured out on this house God did it he said okay he said next interview how did you pay cash for this building next generation building I said I'll tell you exactly how we did it <laughs> God <laughs> sent a man of God who spoke the word of God to the people of God that said if we could build this house for cash if we would believe God we believed God and God opened the windows of heaven and he poured out his blessing on this church and we did it <laughs> hallelujah he just looked at me the word or the person of God is honored when we give him credit, when we testify, when we thank, when we bless. Psalms 63 and 4 says, Bless the Lord. I will bless you, O Lord, while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Psalms 103 and 1, I, I've already sung it. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. We honor him, his person, when we honor his gifts. This, this is a church that knows how to honor the gifts of God. The, the Jesus in, a, in Ephesians 4, 11. God, Christ gave gifts to the church. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, and teachers. What? To edify and to build up the body of Christ. And every time that we've had a guest minister come in, every time we've had someone speak in this house, 
Uh, even if the church didn't know them personally, perhaps they're friends of Debbie and I, or we have some ministry relationship with them, they come. Y'all have been so honoring. Y'all have pulled on the word. Y'all have, have seen that guest speaker as a gift of God. And every time, every time, they speak to me after service and say, if you can't preach in this house, you can't preach. Y'all know how to pull on the word. I said, that's because I tell the folks, drain them dry. Pull on the word. Pull on the word. Come on, say amen. 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 Matthew 10 and 41 says, He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. The New Living Translation of the same passage says, If you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, you will be given the same reward as a prophet. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Honoring the person of Jesus Christ. Honoring the Word of Jesus Christ. We honor the Word of the Lord, that book you're holding in your hand, when we make His Word our first our primary source of guidance in this life. What does the Word say? Psalms 119 and 105 says, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. The Word says it, I'm running with it. If it's contrary to the Word, no, I don't receive it. No, I'm not, I'm not going to accept that. I'm not going to allow it into my hearing, into my heart, into my spirit, into my life. No, the Word of God is my authoritative benchmark for living. It is my strategy. It is my roadmap. It is my plan. It is my blueprint. It is my handbook for living. The Word of God is my guidance in this life. Amen. We honor God's Word when we make or have a biblical world view. That means you view the world through the lens of the Bible. A biblical world view. Everybody's got a world view. Some people have a secular world view. Some people have other types of world view. But the Christian, the believer, should have a biblical world view. Psalms 119.59 says, I ponder the direction of my life and I turn to follow your laws. George Barna, uh, uh, someone who does surveys, and he does surveys primarily of the church and the body of Christ, he did a survey about the biblical worldview. He wanted to know how many people in the United States had a biblical worldview, how many people in the body of Christ had a biblical worldview. So he did a survey. He asked 10 questions. The first one was this, do absolute moral truths exist? The second one is absolute truth defined by the Bible. Number three, did Jesus Christ live a sinless life? Number four, is God the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe? And does he still rule it today? Next, is salvation a gift from God that cannot be earned? Next, is Satan real? Does a Christian have a responsibility to share his or her faith in Christ with other people? Lastly, is the Bible accurate in all of its teachings? Only 9% of born-again believers answered yes to all those questions. 9% of the body of Christ have a biblical worldview. Only 4% of this country has a biblical world view. We've got some work to do. But I declare that I'm going to honor his word. And I will have a biblical world view. And we declare as a church, we will honor his word. And have a biblical world view. And that's next generation of believers that we are nurturing and bringing up to be leaders and pillars in the body of Christ. They will have a biblical world view. We honor God. We honor God's word when we treat it as the bread of life. Jesus said, it's written, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What you live by is the word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Life is in the word that comes from God's mouth. Is there any area of our life that, that needs life? That needs to be resurrected? That needs to be jump-started? You need a word. You need a word. We honor the word of God when we treat it as the foundation of our faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And that's why we teach in this church to pull on the anointing, to pull on the word. I'm after you all the time. And, and I do it in a, in a comic fashion. You know, I say, hey, can, you, can you pull on the anointing for 20 minutes? And, and it's comical because I've never preached a 20-minute message before. <laughs> what, what I'm trying to get you to do is, if I can get you to say amen, which means so be it in my life. If, if I can get you to say amen with something that you agree with, then I can get you to lay hold of that principle of faith to say, yeah, I agree with that. He is my healer. He is my deliverer. He is my Lord, my King. He will prosper me. Come on, church. If I can get you to say amen, I've got it in you. I've got you hooked. If I can say, yes, Lord, so be it in my life. Hallelujah. 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 Finally, honoring his presence is the gateway of divine favor and blessing. Honoring his persons opens the gate. Honoring his word opens the gate. Honoring his presence opens the gate. In Numbers chapter 20, verse 6, I'll read the New Living. It says, Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle where they fell down on the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. The glory filled the tabernacle. The glory filled the temple, the glory, filled the upper room, filled this body temple. Hallelujah. The glory, which means weightiness, the glory, which is the very nature of God, the glory is what we desire when we assemble and worship Him. Amen. Oh, the glory of your presence the church of Jesus Christ the worldwide church of Jesus Christ should hunger for the presence of God because God says that he inhabits the praises of his people Jesus said where two or three are gathered in my name there I am in the very midst of them if we're going to get together and I love to get together with you I mean I really do like y'all a whole bunch but if we're going to get together how about inviting Jesus along come on how about looking for his glory to fill the tabernacle how about for the winds of the Holy Spirit and the rivers of the Holy Spirit and the fire of the Holy Spirit to fall in the house of God again? How about if the glory of God filled the tabernacle? Hallelujah! 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 He said that they fell on their face. And Solomon dedicated the temple it said the priest couldn't stand because of the weight of the glory. The glory pressed upon their spirits. If we honor the person of Jesus Christ, then grace is released. If we honor the word of Christ, then faith is released. If we honor the presence of Christ by his spirit, then the glory is released. The psalmist said, as the deer panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? 
I say right now. Lift your hands with me. Did you get anything out of this today? Hallelujah.